For all the latest news and analysis from every UCF sport, visit blackandgoldbanneret.com, your home for the UCF Knights on SB Nation. We bring you all the latest news and in-depth analysis from across Night Nation, from football and hoops to golf and tennis. If you want to stay on top of all things UCF, visit blackandgoldbanneret.com. Powered by SB Nation. This is the Night Shift Podcast. Powered by Black and Gold Banneret. Your home for news and analysis from all UCF night sports. The Night Shift starts now. And we welcome you to this edition of Night Shift Live postgame show as the UCF Knights back in the win column. Oh, yeah, you bring out the space jerseys. It's a lock for a win, huh? Eric Lopez here uh, with you as the Knights victorious by a final score of 56 to 12. We'll be joined by Bryce Turner momentarily. He's making his way back from the stadium where he had capped the game. Kyle Nash and Don will be in the right now in the post game. They will join us after the post game presser and talk to us a little bit there. Uh, pretty simple game. You look at the stats. Knights completely dominant in this performance. Certainly, we welcome your comments and questions on the chat room. Send your questions and comments. We'll try to get to most of them throughout the show. Of course, you can follow us on the YouTube channel. Subscribe. Give us some comments there on the YouTube channel. Uh, give us a like there. Of course, go to blackandgoldbetterit.com for all the details of all the coverage of UCF Athletics. And, of course, on all the social media platforms. It was a convincing win for the Knights, 56-12, to 12, the final. They dominated from the opening kick, never looked back, led 14 to nothing after the first quarter, led 35-6 to six at halftime. And I think the story of the game, without question, is Dylan Risk getting the start officially. I think we all kind of had a feeling this was the direction they were going to go with after the way he finished last week against BYU. And he was fantastic. 20 of 25 for 294 yards, three touchdowns, a quarterback rating of 218. That's really solid. And really got a lot of receivers involved. Seven receivers in total caught passes, led by Jones, five catches, 106 yards, and a touchdown. Randy Pittman had his best game of the year, five catches, 80 yards, two touchdowns. Kobe Hudson played after a scare last week with the injury. Four catches, 58 yards, leading the way. And, of course, on the ground, UCF dominated with ease. R.J. Harvey, 22 carries, 184 yards, three touchdowns. As a team, the Knights rushed for 308 yards on 44 carries, five touchdowns. UCF ran an average of an 8.7 yards a play, held Arizona to four and a half. UCF, 602 Total yards in the game held Arizona to 261. What a stat this is. UCF 308 yards rushing, Arizona 5 uh, was the stat. And so uh, just a complete annihilation by far, by far, UCF's most complete game of the season. Maybe their most complete game since the Oklahoma State game last year. Uh, certainly uh, tremendous, tremendous performances. Uh, to say the least, from the Knights in that dominant performance. Again, send your questions and comments, and uh, we'll try to get to them as many as we can here on the show. It's quick moving game, too. Ended uh, before 7 Eastern, uh, so that was fun, too. But uh, complete domination for UCF. Four and five. They will play at Arizona State next week. We'll see what the official start time will be for that game. Maybe we'll get that news before we go off the air here on Night Shift uh, Live. And of course, still bowl possibilities. Well, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So, uh, hope everybody should be in a better mood. We'll see if we are uh, in a better mood or not. Uh, but nonetheless, it should be a lot of fun, uh, to say the least. So, uh, people are still kind of leaving the stadium. Leave, let us know your thoughts, what you liked, what you did not like throughout this game, and uh, perhaps a little bit of good feelings moving forward. All right, let's get to some – in fact, we got some comments coming in already. 
Uh, Nelson alumni chiming in. Gotta love the heart of risk with him blocking downfield for running backs. Yeah, he definitely had a lot of energy, a lot of uh, enthusiasm. Uh, I thought brought a spark. We saw that a little bit last week against BYU without question. Uh, in those last two drives. It's kind of wild. And I know we'll get into this throughout the rest. Like he was a fourth string quarterback at one point this season. And yet, I don't think any quarterback we've seen this year threw the ball as well as Dylan Riss did. But right, Dylan Riss brought that spark. Uh, Eric Edwards. So here's my more basic questions. One, did we blow them away because of us? Or is Arizona just that bad? I think it's yes. The answer is that both. I think UCF played well, and Arizona is awful. They have checked out on their head football coach. That team did not want to be there today. And it's funny, for all the frustration and criticism that there's been now and during this five-game losing streak for UCF, I would argue that what's going on in Arizona is far worse because you could tell those players are not playing for Coach Brennan. Remember, they didn't go there to play for Coach Brennan. Coach Brennan is in his first year, was, under, in my opinion, an underwhelming hire from San Jose State. And I, they're just not the same team they were a year ago. They've had a lot of injuries on the defensive side of the ball. I think we saw that defensively. Offensively, they've struggled. Dino Babers, the offense coordinator, is probably going to be gone after this year. They're averaging only like 17 points a game now. They have a five-game losing streak. They're not the same team that was last year that won 10 games under Jed Fish at head coach. Clearly, the coaching change, not by their own doing. Jed Fish left on his own. He went to Washington. But, uh, yeah, rough times at Arizona. The good news for them is bas college basketball season starts this week, so most of those fans will be focused on the basketball team <laughs> from here on out, um, in my view. So maybe that's the positives uh, for them. But I think it's a combination of those two things. And listen – if you're UCF, though, that was the thing they needed to take advantage. I said this. If you listen to the Night Shift show earlier this week on our podcast feed, I said jump on this team early. Arizona didn't have a lot of confidence. Neither of these teams, whoever jumped on the other team, I thought would go away and win this game, and that's exactly what happened. UCF jumped on them early, and you could just tell Arizona was ready to just kind of tap out. And UCF kept it on them, to their credit. So, uh, the, what does this mean moving forward? Hard to say. Will remain to be seen. Uh, a lot of football to be going there. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, other comments here. Jeff Wiseman coming in. Arizona is not great, but proof risk should have been playing a lot sooner. That is going to be a topic I am sure that will pick up steam if Dylan Risk continues to play this well. That will be a question of, you know, the observations of quarterbacks. Of course, anybody that's been a longtime UCF fans knows this has been a constant tradition back in the O'Leary eras. It seemed like every year, like, for example, Rob Calabri started in 08. The year, he wasn't the answer. He started in 09. They benched it. Brett Hodges came off the bench, and he took over and won the job. Ten years ago, George O'Leary started Pete DeNovo for the opener against Penn State in Ireland, and then Justin Holman turned out to be the guy. So, uh, you know, you see, for whatever reason, we've always had some weird issues with quarterbacks. Now, again, I'm not ready to say that Dylan Risk is the long-term answer, but, boy, this is why I said you needed to play the young guys and find out who your quarterback is for 2025, and I thought I was a great move for Gus. And credit to Gus, he tried. Like, a lot of coaches would not have even played Dylan Risk last week. They would have just kept Jakari Brown in the game when the game was already uh, settled. Uh, and he gave him an opportunity, and Dylan Risk, to his opportunity, to his credit, took care, took advantage of that opportunity. Uh, led him to a couple of drives, and I think he probably had a good week of practice, and he's earned that start, and he earned a solid, played a solid performance. And now Dylan Risk... If you're Dylan Risk, you're looking at it as I'm, I, there's a good chance I'm going to start the rest of this year, and if I perform well, I will probably be the favorite to be the starting quarterback going into 2025. Uh, that's a big plus. And if that could happen, if Dylan Risk plays well the rest of the way, regardless of wins and losses, I think as a night fan, you got to feel pretty good about next year, at least in the quarterback room. And I think that would be a big positive. Uh, considering all the issues at quarterback that there has been. Uh, Garrett Wise, Flaming Citronaut. Yes, we stay undefeated no matter what. 
Ale, 8 and 0 That's just tremendous. Uh, dominance there uh, for sure. Holy Hail Mary, says Jeff Wiseman, by the way. I didn't know. Were you a Commanders fan? Yeah, also a Hail Mary went over the Bears with Jalen and Daniels. And, of course, the night this week. This was not a Hail Mary. This was more of a complete annihilation of Arizona. But uh, good, good, rare UCF Washington fan. That's pretty good, um, to say the least. Uh, other action going on, by the way. Florida, Georgia in the fourth quarter, tied 20 all, four minutes to go in that football game. We'll try to get you some other scores because there's some interesting developments. Georgia just scored a touchdown to take the lead. So that's big for that. They, Florida, by the way, Lagway, their young kid was stretchered out. So Florida's on their third string quarterback. Florida State got smoked by North Carolina. So they're on their on track to be a two and ten season for uh, Mike Norvell and company. So it could be worse. It's my point. Could be a lot worse. Kansas State in a struggle against Houston. Eight minutes to go. 1917, Kansas State with the lead in the fourth quarter in that game. Uh, that's a big game for Kansas State. Can't afford to slip up there if they want to maintain their Big 12 uh, championship aspirations. Arizona State, UCF's next opponent, currently leading Oklahoma State 21 to 14. They're in a bit of a weatherish delay there. So, big surprise in the state of Oklahoma uh, that they have that. All right. Back to some questions. Uh, Iowa State, I thank you for that, just went down to Texas Tech 23-22. So Iowa State no longer undefeated. BYU, the only undefeated team left in the Big 12 Conference. Uh, and then there's a game later tonight. TCU and Baylor will play. No late night games this week, which is kind of weird. But uh, Nonetheless, BYU gets set to play Utah. But uh, yeah, Iowa State going down to Texas Tech. And then we'll see what happens with this Kansas State game. That could be really not good for the Big 12 uh, if Kansas State were to lose to a pretty bad Houston team. There is some weather precipitation in Houston area. 6.20 to go in that ballgame. All right. Uh, other thoughts. We're currently reading off the Knights victorious here. And, uh, again, solid game, solid outing. Most complete game. Do you feel better as a Knights fan? What is your reaction after losing, uh, after that losing streak? Do you feel better? Are you more annoyed? What are the feelings like? Feel free to send them out there. Other comments. Uh, we only, uh, certainly people are saying we're going to enjoy this one. That's some of the comments there. Unbelievable. Um, flaming citronauts. Yeah, Iowa State going down. And then other qu questions here coming in. Gus Malzahn and the presser say, yeah, it's going to be hard for Dylan Riss not to start next week. Yeah, I think he's going to start. That's a, that's a pretty safe, uh, safe assumption. Safe assumption there, my friend. In fact, I, I mean, I think he's going to start every game. He's going to have to, right, the rest of the way. Unless Barbarian an injury or... Some deal. I think this is his game uh, and his team now the rest of this way. So we'll see how that uh, develops. David Green, joy. That is the way to describe the emotions right now. For you see football a win for the first time since TCU when it started Big 12 play. Uh, so that's a good feeling. Definitely would agree with that. Uh, according to Kyle Nash, Gus Malzahn mentioned in the post game that BJ Adams was, had an injury, and that's why he did not start. Uh, they hope to have him back next week. That is the uh, question there. Other notable comments on this tremendous, but you get a sense that this team needed that win. They needed that win just to feel good about themselves. When you have a long, losing streak, that is certainly uh, going to be certainly uh, 
fascinating to me, to say the least here. Getting reading off some more comments from the post games. Randy Pittman says, Tim Harris focused this week on bringing the offense back to the basics while also reminding the team to have fun, which had naturally been tough for a team during this losing streak. Um, Pittman on the Hail Mary catch that Jeff Wiseman referred to earlier. Uh, Pittman said, wasn't sure if his Hail Mary catch was a touchdown when he caught it. He was impressed Risk had been able to get the ball in. Quote, he put the ball in the air, gave all of us an opportunity. I was just a guy who was lucky enough to come down with it and score. That was right there, the Hail Mary at the end of the half. Uh, R.J. Harvey said, quote, that today was a dominant performance for the offense with every position group playing well. It was an all-around just great effort for the offenses. That was R.J. Harvey in the postgame presser. Uh, Harvey said that this team was excited for Tim Harris as he took over for the offense this week. Quote, we just wanted to get the win for Coach Harris. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, other comments, Gus Malzahn says it was refreshing for him to be able to step away from running the offense this week and focus more on being the head coach. I love calling plays, but obviously it worked out great today. That was comments from Gus Malzahn. He asked, uh, also said that you can't make a ton of changes to the defense in the season, but that they tried simplifying some things this week and play faster. He points to UCF holding Arizona the less than 10 yards rushing five to be specific. Uh, on the ground game. So those are some of the comments in the post-game presser uh, from Gus Malzahn and some of the players there. Joining us now, he's back home from the stadium where he caught the game in the stands, Bryson Turner. This, uh, this is a rarity here, a pleasant night. Uh, everybody's in a good mood, Bryson. I'm assuming you're in a good mood. Well, I don't know why everybody's worried. It's the space game. We always win the space game. You know, it's it's hilarious. This is almost like you take away the ranked opponent. This is basically a beat for beat replay of last year's space game all over again, where the background of the season is very, is very like doom and gloom. We, you know, not exactly doing, but so hot. And then space, the space game comes around and, Oh, look at that. We have a great football team. What do you know? I mean, it's quite amazing that a, we, when a, we have a quarterback that throws the ball, we have a good game. Like, what a concept, am I right? So, yeah, look, they, they took a risk starting Dylan Risk, but they ended, but he ended up pulling off, I would say, a really good first start, 2025 294. There were some good throws that I saw out of him on this play, and there was a pretty good run, too. I'm not going to lie. I, I was looking straight on from behind when he was running, and I saw the cut. That he made that that he made. I think that it might have been his 33 yard run, or it might have been a little shorter one, but absolutely well done out of Ritz risk today. I think I saw a, a tweet when I was waiting at a red light on the way home that Malzahn said that it's pretty hard to argue against starting risk next. Yeah, time. he's starting them. He's gonna start them. And this is I can agree with that. That being said, I was pretty interested in how he used Jacuri Brown. In this game, you know, I remember zone. yeah, in the red zone. Yeah, I remember a few years ago when Gus tried to make Joey Gatewood a thing. I think this might have been the idea that he was going for with that. Yes, um, I agree. And, and I think it worked for this game specifically, because remember what we said earlier in the week, Eric, that Arizona's red zone defense was going to be something that the Knights really needed to overcome. And so bringing in Ja'Curry for those red zone situations, I think end up really working in this team in this team's favor because it basically means the red zone defense had to keep on it keep on its toes because all of a sudden now you're dealing with a completely different quarterback than you were. So I think that's a, that was a really good uh, that was a really good call from there. We saw some new uh, receivers, even though Kobe Hudson was back in the game. Which, by the way. Great. I'm really glad that Kobe Hudson is okay enough to play I, after what we saw last week. But look, look at that, Jacoby Jones, once again, having a great ball game. I was really impressed to see him, Randy, you know, Pittman getting in the game more. We, I've been saying, like, I feel like that after Kobe Hudson, that Randy, that Pittman just seems like the guy you want to factor into the game more on a receiving on, on a receiver's front. And lo and behold, he's. He's really meshing well. It's amazing it's, when you have a quarterback that can make multiple reads and all of a sudden all the receivers look better, isn't it? 
And how about that Hail Mary? I know he probably only did that just to give him some practice with a Hail Mary situation. Yeah, Jeff Wiseman in the chat mentioned that he's a Commanders fan, so he's on cloud nine because the Commanders won the game last week on a Hail Mary, and then UCF here at the, with the Hail Mary at the end of the half. It was pretty wild. Well, let's put it this way. Like, there was no risk risk with that Kyle, Hail Mary. Yeah, right, Kyle here. Yeah, um, gonna, they're going to have all the puns, Eric. It's all the puns. So, um, yeah, by the way, big update up. here. Houston just scored a touchdown with 231 to go, and it is 24-19 Houston over Kansas State. The quarterback ran a quarterback draw, and Kansas State had no answer. So Kansas State, this would be a disastrous loss for Kansas State. It would be their second Big 12 conference loss. Might knock them out of the Big 12 title chase. Although Iowa State, Bryce, I don't know if you heard, lost to Texas Tech. So there's only one undefeated left in the Big 12, and that's BYU. But the Big 12 beating each other up. Uh, Arizona State, who is UCF's next opponent, is leading Oklahoma State, but they're in a bit of a weather delay on that. Let's get to some other comments. Big 12, Brad climbing in. Speaking of Dillard Risk. Risk is consistently throwing accurate balls. He has the it factor, too. Now, again, it's a little early. Arizona's terrible. I think they quit on their coach, Brennan. Uh, that being said, though, boy, it didn't, do, it didn't look nice, some of those throws, didn't it, there, Bryson? And it's, you know, I think, people, you know, I think everybody knew that Dylan had a, the, missed the possibility to be a really good, solid quarterback and the, maybe the best passer on the roster. I think people were wondering, is he too small? Is he too slow? Whatever. But it's what what happened. This is why you give guys opportunities in game uh, on, in game play because you just never know. And I give Gus credit; he played risk at the end of the game last week. Risk, to his credit, took advantage of that and er earned himself playing time. And you know, one thing about Gus, it hasn't worked out this year. But it wasn't for lack of trying. Gus basically fired himself as the play caller, fired the defensive coordinator. He's gone through four quarterbacks, and you know. At least for this week, it worked. Yes, you are right about that. I think the biggest question that coming out of this is how much is how much of this is Arizona getting caught off guard by the different play calls because you know because you toss out the film completely from before because it's a different play calling situation now, or but then again, I think Gus did say if I remember in one of the oppressors that it's really more not the same playbook, just you know somebody different, like just making the calls this time. And so the film might still work. But I think that the change definitely really helped keep Arizona on its toes and maybe compounded the issue. Well, like I, I, I remember we said in the podcast earlier this week, Arizona had some confidence issue. They've been struggling. I don't think those players are playing for their coach, that coach Brennan. Remember they didn't Brennan's his first year head coach there in Arizona. Those players didn't go there to play for him. And I think if you jumped on them early, they were going to kind of cave. And that's what we saw there happen. Uh, Brian W. Peterson salute to him saying he uh, could, could to see uh, he was at the game uh, to say the least. Kansas state's got the ball two Oh one to go. It's a third down Houston up five in the fourth quarter in that game. That's uh, that would be something. Willie Fritz there trying to uh Quiley's getting Houston more competitive after they look like clearly the worst team in the league early in the year. Kansas State gets a first down right into the 2 minute timeout, but uh but risk was tremendous. Let's talk about the defense. I don't know if you heard some of the comments that I was reading off the from the post game. You know, the players seem to be excited RJ Harvey talked about playing this for giving playing for Tim Harris. They were excited for Tim Harris to get this opportunity. I would imagine the defensive players, they looked excited to play for Addison Williams on the TV anyway. I do think those players played hard, and I think they played for those coaches today and for that opportunity that each of them got. Did you get a sense of that watching it? I think so. There was, I mean, Ricky Barber, what a game out of him. Just, uh, once again, Dotson. Having a great game, having a really solid game as well. Ladarius Tennyson, I heard his name called out a lot there. And then, of course, you had the fumble recovery that, that I actually kind of feel like the fumble recovery might have been like arguably the turning point of the game. Because once that happened, once that happened and UCF started to go up multiple scores, that is just a already maybe a, I don't know if I want to say weak willed, but maybe like a non-motivated or at least not as motivated Arizona team with the coach thing that you mentioned you have a turnover and you go down multiple scores that quick and you just fold and so I feel like that 
turnovers are huge. We've said that this entire season. And I think that one was a major factor in all of this, but solid, solid play from there. Ricky Barber, two and a half tackles for loss, one and a half sacks. Ethan Barr doing a great job. Yeah. I think that they definitely played really hard. Addison Williams, like, I noticed a lot more tackles that weren't, there weren't as many missed tackles. There was maybe like the odd one or two, but you can maybe attribute that to the, how slippery it was because of the rain. And, but yeah, I really saw this, this defense play really hard and Addison Williams getting back into the coordinator chair, I think could easily have something to do with that there. It's, it's just interesting because Addison Williams, I definitely think it's a very talented coach. And so I can under so and so the situation with the coordinator feels weird because on the one hand you definitely want to give him some experience but on the other hand you also want to take advantage of the guys you have right now. I think at least now the with the course correction that has been made it seems like it at least has brought brought a spark into the locker room. And I think Gus even said that he needed to fu- that he made the QB change in order to find a spark with this offense and so I think the coaching change kind of helped make a spark and maybe it was, it was the coaching change all along that really is what's needed it helped bring a spark to everybody else and not just you know changing one player that's out that's out there yeah in fact it was interesting some of the post-game comments i'm reading right now uh talk about simplifying things on the defensive side which i thought was an interesting comment there simplifying things maybe things are a little uh too complicated uh, yeah, you know, a young defensive coordinator versus a more uh, a, a very a much more experienced one in Ted Roof who could maybe do. I could see that. I could see that. Uh, Dylan Risk on the po the Dylan well, Dylan Risk spoke in the post game today. How about that? Uh, said that even when he was lower on the depth chart, Gus Malzahn told him to be ready because you never know when your time comes. Luckily, quote, I was prepared when my time came. Great message there, and I think that's the cool story about the Dylan Risk is in this era where a lot of people bail as soon as they don't get their way and they don't get playing time and their mama and their their papa get all mad and upset. Bail. This kid stuck right here, and that's a great lesson there. He waited for his opportunity there, Bryson, and, uh, man, it looks really good. Uh, Absolutely. I am absolutely – I think – you know, it's funny. I still remember when Risk when Risk was first, you know, recruited here. And I think I still remember some people were saying that he could easily be the quarterback of the future. It, it took a bit of a winding road to get there, but I think we might I think we might have it. Or at the very least, you know, at least we can be with if both Risk and Colson go into the offseason remaining on UCF, then we could at least be be relatively uh, take solace in the fact that there's op- that there's options. And Kansas State just got intercepted, Bryson. There's an interception with a minute 43 to go. Avery Johnson just got picked off. Houston will get the ball. Kansas State has two timeouts, but a first down away from pulling a big upset and a big, big result uh, that really hurts Houston, Kansas State's chances the Big 12 championship aspirations and probably hurts the Big 12 chances of being a two-bid league for the uh, playoff really benefits Colorado, actually. If you think about it, Colorado, right in that mix there, Bryson, uh, with one well, here's so. Well, here's a question for you because I know, because we talk about this with other sports tournaments as well. What happens if, say, BYU runs the table and gets to the Big 12 championship and then they get upset? Because and and then they get upset. Do they get right. it? Does that Big Twelve become? Does that is that the only way the Big Twelve would be a multi bid league? Maybe that's probably their best bet at this point. Yes, that's a very good point. Yes, could be. Um, and even then, I mean, because the thing that hurts BYU is their best win is Kansas State. So we'll see if uh, Houston runs uh, runs it out. All right, Matt J with a comment. Get send your comments and questions. Not saying our problems are solved, but I've said all along we just needed a quarterback who can complete basic throws to keep defenses honest and keep our defense off the field, and we only lost uh, two-thirds of the way there. I agree. Uh, It's funny, right, Bryce, when you have good quarterback play, that tends to hide some of the flaws you have, and I think we saw that a little bit today. Now, again, it's Arizona. I think Arizona is terrible at this point. I think most of those players have checked out. That being said, though, yes, 
good quarterback play. And, so, and, and really, that's the name of the game in football, and especially in the collegiate level, because you look at a team like Miami, for example. I watched Miami earlier today. I've seen a lot of Miami this year. I don't think Miami's that great of a team. Their defense is not very good. But what they have is a great quarterback in Cam Ward, who's probably the front runner for the Heisman Trophy, him and Travis Hunter anyway. And he hides a lot of the flaws for Miami. And I think if UCF can get that kind of play this year, they don't even need a great quarterback. They need a solid quarterback because they have a great running game with a great running back like R.J. Harvey. Now, all of a sudden, with the performance that Dylan Risk had today, for the remaining UCF opponents, you have to respect the passing game of UCF now that maybe you haven't all year. Yes, absolutely. And considering how just deadly it is, I mean, R.J. Harvey, once again, I, I, like, I know R.J. Harvey has done, has had really great performances despite the passing, you know, being not necessarily there all the time. But you look at the difference with R.J., like, with R.J. between the, what, like, 184 yards. I mean, that's like, I want to say maybe, like, what, maybe 50 yards difference? Usually, you know, like RJ's gotten above 100 yards before, but he nearly got 200 in this one. And by the way, I don't know if you gotten a chance to talk about this before I came on, but he absolutely just blew past Alex Haynes for the second most career rushing yards in UCF history dur during this game. I mean, and this and what's crazy is Miles Montgomery still got a solid number of carries on this one. Yeah, Risk got some runs. You got Jacuri Brown getting a few. Johnny Richardson got in. It's not like they were feeding the ball to RJ every time. RJ only got the ball maybe like half the time. So this, this that's what a great passing passing attack is going to be able to do for you. It's just it's going to let you be able to just let RJ Harvey have more room to work with, and that's definitely not something that you want to give RJ Harvey if you're a defense facing off against him. Uh, let's see. Matt J has been pretty frustrated with the sky's falling mentality of the fan base. Yeah, I hear you there, Matt. Yeah, that's college football fans in a nutshell in a week to week sport, especially the power conference. That's kind of how it is. You're right. So, yeah. by the way, really cool stat that I just saw from the UCF football Twitter account the point differential for UCF in space games is 246 points all, uh, all time. Eight, eight and no. Oh. I just I was saying gambler's fallacy has our side and look at that it did I don't know what it is about the space game like it was like it's like almost like a beat for beat like it was last year like, like it was last year even with the rain even with the rain when the rain started coming down uh me and a friend of mine I managed to find when I was in the stadium we walked uh, we went down into the concourse this was after the first touchdown and we went below the concourse and bought these uh bought this uh this poncho uh the white one with the logo there was a bunch of them out there i think they sold out like by the time that we purchased purchased ours for about 10 bucks but um we ended up missing the fumble recovery in our and first rj harvey touchdown because that's where we were during that time but i'll say this despite the weather it was a pretty solid a pretty solid turnout at, at fbc mortgage stadium obviously people went you know left the left their seats when the rain started but they can't but once you got you, you, you get some ponchos the rain lightens up a bit and everyone came back it was it really reminded me of the other of the oklahoma state space game just the only difference being is that that was a ranked opponent and this is and this is arizona we have nelson, uh nelson alumni says do we protect the space game to continue the win streak or do we schedule it for a toughest game next year I don't know if you can predict that. I mean, when they scheduled this at the beginning of the year, Arizona was supposed to be one of the toughest games. If Arizona was a preseason top 25, they've had a lot of injuries on the defensive side of the ball. They've had some offensive struggles. So I don't think you could predict that. Matt J commented, yeah, Eric, this just really sucks. That this, this was supposed to be our season, given the experience we have on the team. Ha had we had a serv serviceable QB, who knows? See, this is why I think, Eric, I know you talk about the sky is falling mentality, and I do understand why it can be overblown sometimes. But at the same time, I think Matt, Matt J definitely kind of hints at the point here of why this fan base has had the sky is falling mentality is because we were coming into this season where it looked like this was our best chance in a while to compete for a big 12 title right away because 
I've said this before, I think, during before the season, that this was our best chance with the experience that we have. If we don't get it this year, we're going to have to kind of like let the recruiting cycle come forth. And who knows? And who knows how long if that's going to take? So that being said, but, though, but at some point, I mean, I don't think that's a, I mean, a bad thing. Like, I think maybe if you're recruiting as well as, as these ex so called, you know, recruiting experts claim, you should play some of these recruits. I don't think UCF should be in a position every year where you're, you you got to get 30, 40 guys out of the portal. I don't know if that's the winning recipe. You don't have the resources like other schools do for that. So uh, I think there's a balance act. I think everybody's trying to figure this out in this era, uh, to say the least. It's a tricky you know, deal. We saw Ky- Speaking of recruits, we saw Kylan Fox out there. Which Correct. Is, which, which no, is and I, I think this was the best of both worlds. You win a game, you keep, you got, you know, and you're playing young guys and you're learning about some guys that might help you next year. I, I think to me, that's a, it, it's the best of both worlds on that uh, situation. Let's bring in Kyle Nash, who is set up somewhere. Where are you, Kyle? I'm actually right by one of the, uh, the concourse entrances to the field. I wanted to feature the third MVP of this game, the rain. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, just like last, just like last season, Kyle Nash. Um, no, nah, well, yeah. If you want to call the other space game, sure, hundred percent. But this time, it decided to stop. Uh, let's say after that game, and not this one. But nonetheless, just a a, a pretty complete performance, you got to say, gentlemen. All right, let's get to it, Kyle. Your thoughts? A lot of people in the chat very excited about Dylan Risk and his performance. Your overall thoughts here. Yeah, actually, it was our own uh, Donnie Docs, Don Struble, who asked uh, um, Coach Malzahn about this right afterwards. He'll be joining shortly, of course. Who asked Coach Malzahn if he feels like uh, Dylan Risk is the starter moving forward. And Gus basically said it would pretty be pretty hard to argue. I think the exact words that Coach Malzahn used were, it's common sense that he'll be starting the next football game. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. You're right. Uh, Kyle, we said this in the night shift uh, earlier this week. If you The key in this game I, was to jump on the opponent, right? Two teams that have got losing streaks, confidence issues. UCF jumped on them from that first drive. Cuss took the ball instead of deferring. Went there, drove, got a turnover, converted, went up two scores. And I thought Arizona at that point kind of mailed it in the rest of the way. And UCF had their way with them. Uh, but that's what you need to do when you got a team like Arizona that probably is not all in, bought in right now to what they're doing. And UCF took advantage, and I thought it was their most complete game of the year by far. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, listen, after the second drive, Arizona's running stats were negative nine yards on three carries and a lost fumble. The defense had something to do with it, too. I, whether or not it had directly to do with Ted Roof's replacement or not, what I can tell you is that this defensive front was an excellent performer tonight. And listen, your boy, Eric Lopez, Dalen Dotson, stepping in, playing inside, outside all year was huge. I actually asked Ethan Barr after the game about uh, uh, Dalen Dotson and just his role and what he's been involved with. And coming up huge, giving an actual good edge defense, taking away some outside runs as what happened earlier in in the game was certainly a big part of UCF defense making the Wildcats one-dimensional. Kyle, let me ask you, get to the defense. There were some comments I saw about the postgame talking about how they simplified some things defensively. What what did you read into that comment that was said in the postgame? Do you buy into that, that they simplified some things with Addison yeah, running yeah, the, the defense now? Ethan addressed that, too. Basically, a lot of the big, big things that were being brought up was wrap up on your tackles. I know we saw a number of times throughout the the year so far where there's just been bumps and prayers that they go out of bounds and it doesn't always pan, turns into a big play. That did not happen tonight, obviously. A lot of wrapping up and and keeping your lanes, staying disciplined, containing the outside. Like we mentioned with Dalen Dodson a bit ago, that became a focus. And, And, you know, it was interesting hearing Ethan Barr talk about not having Ted Roof around, interacting with now defensive coordinator Addison Williams in a way that he hadn't before. But apparently, listen, Ethan is a veteran. He's played SEC ball. It's not like he's foolish. They clicked and made it work. And and there were those were the elements that Ethan said they practiced or rather focused on in practice, you, you know, to make sure they were shored up. And listen, it wasn't just Ethan that ate because of it. I know you, Bryson Turner, were 
were texting in the group about how you impressed you were with uh, Ricky Barber. Yeah. So there's just a lot of good play up front. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 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 I was talking about Ricky Barber earlier. And yeah, Dalen Dotson, though, did have himself a, re a, a really great game as well. Uh, just being in the stands, you know, you hear uh, our own Jeff Sharon on the PA mic calling the uh, defense, calling the defenders making plays out there. And I was just hearing Ricky Barber's name a lot out there. Let me tell you. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's always good. You like it when you get a fat guy spot, you got a fat guy set, right? You know, that kind of thing. And, and not just to, not to be outdone, of course. Big guys perform for the offense as well. That that Hail Mary play, we got to talk to both Dylan Risk and uh, Randy Pittman about it. And the shock and awe that both of them talked about that, did that just happen? And then kind of the butterflies that took place during the review of the play were very interesting to hear to say the least. But it's funny, Dylan, as a young quarterback, came in and paid tribute to the running backs and everybody behind them providing offense and help and and how much that involved his success. But let's be honest, gentlemen, Dylan did his part to open up that game as well. And this is part of why tonight's the night we're talking history for RJ Harvey. Are you yeah. sold on Dylan risk, Kyle, moving forward? I mean, who else is left? <laughs> who else is left? By the way, Two stats that I'll drop for you here. Well, I'll drop one of them so Don, uh, 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 Donnie Docks can drop in the other one. Highest passing quarterback performance this year with 294. Not quite a 300-yard game, but this was a game that had as much passing action in it as K.J. Jefferson in Colorado, except just a little bit more. And I know we can talk about, oh, well, that Hail Mary play. It was, 40, it was, what, 45 yards? He might have gotten another completion that long at some point in the game, too, if he were on there longer, right? So I, I you got to give credit to this young man stepping in and stepping up as big as he did. And I know that it's only fair to mention, oh, but this was an Arizona team with all the injuries. That's fine. But if you were going to try a new quarterback, a reeling team like this, much like we said about Cincinnati, right, Eric? A reeling team like this is the time you bring in a new guy. Um, and, and obviously that play paid dividends. And like Coach says, it's going to be common sense that he starts on the road in Arizona State. Well, Kyle, you said that you had another stat you wanted Donnie Docks to drop in. Well, speak of the devil, look who decided to pop in. Don, Don Struble, Donnie Docks up in the – up in Roth Tower where I, usually, where I was, I believe, just recent, recently. Uh, Don, how you doing, my friend? Doing well. How are you guys? Feeling great, feeling great. So what's this stat that Kyle's been telling us all about you wanted to drop? Yeah, so, I mean, Dylan had the strongest statistical performance of any UCF quarterback that stepped on the field this season, 294 yards, which, as he alluded to, was the highest uh, yardage total. Uh, but he also did so at an 80% clip with three touchdowns and no interceptions. 80%! I'm sorry. Yeah. I've been excited. Yeah, no, it, it was absolutely excellent. I mean, he had a strong connection with everyone. Let's see. I think he – yeah, he had six – Seven receivers involved, uh, led the way by Jacoby Jones and Randy Pittman Jr. Um, you know, I, I asked him post game. You know, you're waiting for your moment. Another guy that's waiting for his is Jacoby Jones. Uh, they've obviously developed a strong connection. Um, I mean, Jacoby, five receptions for 106 yards, another touchdown. Um, it it goes to show that. His performance last week was not a garbage time fluke. He came in and he was a strong contributor today. And I think um, it, it really uh, contributed to Dylan's success overall. Absolutely. All five targets, by the way, Jacoby Jones ended up with. All five targets. He Every time he threw the ball to Jacoby, he caught it. You are absolutely right. The emergence of Jacoby Jones has honestly been quite interesting to watch over these last couple of games. I mean, the precise quote from Dylan was, if he, if I see him one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to throw the ball up. It, it, without hesitation, you you might be seeing the future top uh, pairing for this offense, you know. Or maybe they're not in the room yet, Eric, obviously. But if there's a bar to be cleared, it might be these two guys right now, Eric. By the way, update, they are storming the field in Houston as the Cougars have knocked off Kansas State 24-19. to Willie Fritz, wow. man. Quietly, Houston, who looked like for a while would be the worst team in the Big 12, they're not quietly four and five overall. They're, they got a shot to be bowl uh, with a couple wins away. They might be bowl eligible. Crushing loss for Kansas State. 
That's their second Big 12 loss. Put some two back of BYU. the only undefeated team left in the Big 12. Iowa State lost to Texas Tech earlier today. So uh, it's looking more and more like BYU perhaps versus either Iowa State or Colorado. Iowa State still got to play Colorado. Uh, not Colorado. Uh-oh, Colorado still play Kansas State. Prime time. It's not going to be happy, guys. Colorado. Oh, if you're Brett Yormark, you're hoping. Uh, but that's the story there of the Big 12 uh, situation uh, there, to say the least. Um, let's see. Oh, we got some other comments here. People talk, giving props to Colorado. Uh, we got Matt J. Just wanted to tune in for and say thanks for you do what you do, boys. Capping off a wonderful game day with a Colorado Mountain Sunset. <laughs> that sounds pretty good line. Uh, so where? Are we, what do you think, guys? Where is UCF now? Does this game erase the, the struggles? Is this now you're kind of waiting to see? Where is your mindset now as this team gets ready to go to Tempe, Arizona? I mean, well, we said it on the night shift last week, didn't we, Eric? This is the part of the schedule where we expected things to get a little weaker. Matter of fact, I don't know that the big changes were what made this win happen. I think maybe not playing a ranked team in back-to-back weeks for once was something that had a little to do with it. Not to mention the mystique of the space game. Ethan Barr, as a, as a guy who's here as a fifth-year transfer, I don't mean any offense when I say a one-year player who's, you know, coming in as, as an experienced guy, even felt the mystique himself. He had mentioned talking to the team before the game, hey, I've never played in a space game, but I know we win, so that's what we have to do. And, that's, you know, that's what he told the guys before the game. So having that mystique hit a new guy and have him use it to motivate the team that way, I think said volumes for how this defense got prepared for the football game. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, you're absolutely right. I think, I think this at least shows that these changes are the possible right way to do this. Do these changes necessarily help UCF succeed against a, a game like last year, like last week, or the you know the weeks before that against Cincinnati or anything like that? Maybe, but it's all about consist consistency. And so I think at the very least, this this game I think gives UCF fans a reason to hope going into Arizona state. I think that being said though, the, that time zone difference is definitely going to, I think, play a role in itself. And so there's a little bit of an apples and oranges at play, but at the very least, I think this gives UCF fans reasons to hope for, to for bowl eligibility. And then as far as the younger guys go hope for this, what this team could look like in 2025. You know, Eric, what you mentioned the stakes. Okay. A win in Arizona, heading into the bye week, only needing one of the last two games to make a bowl, I think that that says volumes plenty for what next week could mean. Yeah, no no doubt. We'll see about that. Uh, Give me you guys, three of you, uh, Bryson mentioned this earlier about R.J. Harvey's performance and the milestones he's reaching. Give me uh, your thoughts, Don and Kyle, both seeing R.J. there in person. Oh, let me go ahead and also uh, give some quick context because I just crunched some numbers while everybody was talking. So RJ Harvey now has 1,201 201 rushing yards for the season. That is the fifth most single season rushing yards in program history, passing 2018 Greg McRae. RJ Harvey now has is now two of his seasons are a part of the top five single season rushing yards in program history. Kevin Smith didn't do that. Marquette Smith didn't yeah, do no, that. Yeah, no, Kevin Smith only ran for 2,500 yards and won a conference title. Let's hey, never yeah, mention – let's not – let, let him talk about – But not multiple Harvey. seasons. By the way, hold on. Let, let's, also, let's also be fair. There's more games being played now than there were back then. Like, we're, we're RJ got – We're just talking about what R.J. Harvey did. Take it easy. He's bro. very nice. Very good. Very nice and comp. They're, you know, give Kevin Smith 13 games. He probably rushes for 3,000 yards. Uh, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I turn into Skip Bayless when we get into this Kevin Smith. I am a, a defender of uh, for Kevin Smith. Okay, I'm just gonna say that. In all, but in all seriousness, certainly RJ's had a heck of a run, and uh, nobody seems to, the teams know they try to stop him, but they can't. Yeah, isn't that the brilliance of it? We know you're coming. We're gonna stack the box. We're gonna get everybody and their mama. You're still gonna put up what ninety yards at least, seventy-five yards at least, right? And maybe he'll hit you with a wheel route, too. 
the versatility of what RJ brings is amazing. This is what makes him a pro caliber running back. And, and Don, I mean, from your perspective, I know you just joined us, you know, uh, covering UCF sports recently. But from your perspective, when you watch RJ Harvey, what do you say? I mean, he's the embodiment of prolific. He is just excellent in every facet. I mean, he can he can catch out of the backfield. I mean, he has incredible vision, like Gus Malzahn alluded to tonight, excellent lateral quickness. I mean, we're talking about someone, 22 rushes, 184 yards. That's an average of eight and a half yards per game on the ground. And when you have someone that is having such a strong performance like he did, it really opens up the rest of the offense. I mean, it really gives an opportunity for your quarterback to perform well, like Dylan Risk did tonight. It opens up the pass game because you have to account for this one player being so dominant, and they just didn't have an answer for him. I mean, he was just – he came out there um, with a mission to complete, and, you know, RJ said that he's not someone who says much, but when he has something to say, people are going to listen. And I think that he really um, – proved himself as a leader. Uh, he transcended his great play and proved himself as a leader for his team, for them to come in there and snap this five game losing streak. So uh, yeah, he's a pro caliber player. Um, and he he's the, he's the focal point of their offense and he's going to continue to be for the rest of this season. And um, we'll definitely miss him when he's gone. And a pro caliber running back, by the way, that is now tied with Latavius Murray for the third most career UC rushing touchdowns in UCF history and one away from tying Willie English for second. Imagine if the Tavius Murray played for a head coach that actually knew how to use him. Like, you know, Gus knows how to use RJ. Unfortunately for Latavius, he played for a coach that had no idea how to use him. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for Kyle. To, Kyle I mean, thank you. No, I mean, seriously. I got to back Eric on the Latavius Murray statement. Yeah. This is a dude that was starting his 10th year in the NFL when you and I last talked to him last year. Unbelievable. And he's where he's at in college. No, that's a missed opportunity. I'm with Eric on this one. I mean, golly, there were running backs that George was playing over him, and they're going to use all this nonsense of off the field, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Latavius Murray should have gotten more carries and probably would have had more success in that 2011 2012 range. He was a stud. That's why sometimes you got to be careful about getting married to stats because there's a lot of circumstances beyond a player's control. Uh, Latavius is fantastic, but certainly, I mean, let me ask you this, then, gentlemen. If I told you, give me a Mount Rushmore UCF running backs. Who's your Mount Rushmore? I mean, is RJ, RJ in it? Is RJ in it? Yeah, RJ's on it right behind Kevin. Those are the easy ones, right? I mean, and then for me, I put A Train himself, Alex Haynes, on there. The fourth guy is one I'll defer to my historians in the room in Bryson and Eric, right? Would you go Tay? Because he has been had the best NFL career of all the running backs. And again, he was great when he was at UCF when he actually got the ball. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think I think mine would be Kevin Smith, R.J. Harvey, Latavius Murray, and then you flip a coin between Willie English and Mark Giacom. I think it's um, I think you flip I think you flip a coin between e either one of them. You could make an argument for either or. I'll say English just a little bit, but Giacone is certainly. Uh, but Giacone was on both playoff teams in 1986 and 1990. So, you see this, Kyle? He meets him last night at the Hall of Fame pre uh, media availability. Now he's all in. He's all in. I, I, all yeah, right. it's funny. I would think the newer guy would more appreciate running backs <laughs> that are more versatile and can catch passes too, like Latavius Murray, who would have been my fourth. But what do I know? I'm just a student of the game. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, you put, the thing is, is that you put R.J. Harvey up against an Adrian Killens, Greg McRae, or Otis Anderson. All of them. I all of them. R.J. has taken all this on by it, uh, all this on, like arguably, like he is like the main workhorse in all in all well, of these things. Let me ask you this, then. I mean, it's an interesting point. That wasn't supposed to be the case, right? Like. They added Penny Boone. They've added Montgomery, right? The whole hype in August was this is the best backfield in the, of the country. It hasn't played out that way. Is Do you think the coaching staff has a bit of a, in hindsight, wishes maybe you don't go after two running backs in the portal. Maybe you just go after one of them. Montgomery was the first one. And maybe you could, you know, go after another position. It seems like, and again, uh, it's hindsight, but – was it really necessary to get two backs out of the transfer portal when you know RJ is going to carry the load? You're not using enough hindsight, Eric Lopez. Please tell me a year lately where everybody's been healthy in that backfield, quarterbacks included, okay? 
<laughs> that's part of what you're talking about. Heck, even going back, starting Otis Anderson and Greg McRae and those guys together, they would alternate starts because one would get hurt versus the other. The difference here is guys like Isaiah Bowser um, or smaller guys like McRae or Otis Anderson would get hurt based on hits. Um, you know, in Bowser's case, he was a bigger guy, but he was still getting hurt because he had such a big load. I think the difference is R.J. Harvey, after that first year where he missed a year because of injury, he just hasn't really seen much more injury after that. Miles Montgomery this year had an injury himself. Um, Johnny Richardson, I think, is a guy who, it looks, I mean, he's a good speed back, but the problem is when he's on the field, defenses and power conferences can make adjustments when you change it back. If you see Johnny on the field, you know what's going to happen, and so I feel like that's kind of limited his effectiveness to this point. But, hey, if that if Johnny Richardson is your weakest link, you've got one hell of a chain. As for Penny Boone, I, I don't know what the issue is there, I'll be honest, but I'm just speaking for the other guys. And the reason so many were recruited, Eric Lopez, is the assumption would be at some point somebody was going to get hurt and that relief was going to be necessary. Well, they haven't necessary to this point, uh, needless to say. I want to talk about the secondary that UCF was without – Brandon Adams now can now be Jay Adams. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't even know. Whatever. Got to get used to it. Whatever. Like I Just spoke to him in August. He was fine with Brandon, and he changed the guess to BJ. Anyway, <laughs> nonetheless, he'd been arguably been the best corner this year. Uh, I think Gus said in the post game guy. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That it was a, an injury thing, but they think he might get him back next week. Yet That's correct. they didn't they didn't really miss him. I mean, you're going against one of the best wide receivers in the country, McMillan. And I think all things considered, I think UCF has to be happy how they handled McMillan. Uh, they didn't let him dominate the game. In fact, McMillan, whether it was his number, his final number, six catches, 84 yards, and a touchdown. I think you take that and run with it if you're UCF, considering this guy is going to be a first round stud wide receiver in this upcoming draft. What did UCF do that was so successful? against McMillan and why they did not miss Adams. I, they concentrated on the quarterback, Eric, right? The guy needs to get the ball to be effective. And the reason why they didn't need B.J. Adams is because the game plan was to make the quarterback's life incredibly difficult. I feel like that happened tonight, don't you guys? So, you know, I think that element is taking is not so much taking B.J. out of the game because of injury, but taking the secondary, for the most part, out of the game so they weren't as necessary, especially when Jakari, uh, uh, Jakari Anderson has back-to-back P.I. calls to help Arizona get one of their touchdowns there. That was a rough particular series for him and the DBs in general. But that would be the one time I feel like the defensive uh, front wasn't getting to the quarterback. It was late in the game. Maybe they were calling off the dogs a bit. I don't know. But, yeah, I, I think that was the biggest part of it was taking the defensive backs out of the game. And how about Malachi Lawrence, by the way, getting a pair of sacks and a pair of tackles for loss in, in, in the picture as well? Like you mentioned pressuring the quarterback. Like, yeah, the, 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 these defenders were doing that this entire game. I mean, you look at the receiving, and what's interesting is, is that when Arizona receivers got the ball, they were making some solid ground, like you know, solid ground. Like uh, Hunter has had 35 yards after catch with his 102 receiving yards. McMillan's 38 yards after catch out were out were after the catch out of the 84 that he got. So McMillan was still able to like, you know, maneuver when he got the ball, but you pressure the quarterback and you're able to mitigate that. Sort of. Uh, you got to first of all, you got to keep it up for the entire game. Yeah, there were some impressive plays he made on the move, but I think a lot of those plays that you're talking about are connected to risks or die rolls that the defense made and lost. Fortunately, that happened far less than the ones that they won where they had him uncomfortable. They had him on the run away from perhaps the first read and really did a better job of breaking down the play. Listen, the first touchdown that Arizona got where he made the throw on the run to number 84, the huge tight end there, was a great was a great uh, example of solid football on the run by a quarterback. Puts the ball right where it needs to be. Maybe the defense for UCF was a little bit thin in that part of the field. But like I said, I think there's an element of calculated risk there that the quarterback has to first get loose and then second, make a very difficult throw. And when you're playing actual aggressive defense, which we didn't know Addison Williams being, you know, as a coach that executes that way, a very interesting thing we saw tonight, fellows, right? 
when you're being aggressive like that, sometimes you're going to give up the big plays like that. You just need to be able to strap back in and keep attacking. Because at the end of the day, big plays, you don't take a lot of time off the clock. It's just that much sooner before you get to rest if you're on defense. By the way, third down, fellas. Good times, right? Wow, I was really happy for Addison, who was the D coordinator, got much maligned last year. Certain people in their night class articles called him out. Boy, he had a good game today. Gets yeah. back. Maybe he, and maybe he did learn a thing or two while Ted was running the defense on certain things. You apply some things you saw from an aggressive standpoint, but then you do some of the other things. I got to believe, too, those players, I mean, the sense I got in the postgame and reading some of the quotes is they were playing for him. He's, their, he's been known as their best recruiter on that staff. I'm happy for that guy because, let's be honest, he's really handled this well. A lot of coaches would not have handled, you know, whatever you want to call it, demotion, whatever you want to call it, his situation very well. But he's kind of stayed the course. I've always enjoyed talking to him on media days, uh, I, Kyle, and I don't, I don't know how often you talk to him. So I, I was happy for him. It's a, a young coach getting this another opportunity here, and I think he's going to make the most of it. Yeah, I think that's a big part of Gus's motivation, you know, with that particular piece um, is to keep the younger coaches developing. And Dom, remind me, I know you talked a little bit about it with Coach in postgame, but he had a lot to say about Tim Harris taking over the offense as well. Yeah, yeah, he did. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of moving parts with this team. Uh, we, we thought that there was, you know, at least for me personally, I felt like there was a level of instability that was really shrouding this team amidst the losing streak. But it feels like this is a coaching staff that has been together for a long time um, and they really work cohesively. I know it's just one game, but what we've seen offensively and defensively was just an excellent game plan put together. I mean, defensively, they were finally able to get home. They had four sacks, you know, and that really played a role. And then offensively, I mean, uh, Tim Harris did a great job. They just really put together a great performance and a great strategic effort in the midst of all the chaos. And, um, you know, it starts at the top and it makes its way down. And at least for one game, it looks like Gus made the right decisions, though they may have been hard decisions for him to make. All right. Well, didn't Ethan Barr say to you that this felt like a reset when you asked him, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I asked him if this felt like a reset. And, uh, you know, especially with the tradition of the space games, they remain undefeated. And that's one of the positive takeaways moving forward uh, as we look forward to the final few games. Um, so I, I think that everyone's really bought in um, that this was what they needed. And it feels like uh, some stability has returned to this team. All right, uh, last question for Kyle. We're going to let him go and go back into that monsoon. My God, it looks brutal out behind you. It is. I mean, I'm waiting for Eric Burris to pop up behind you and just call like a you know, <laughs> tropical storm warning or something. Um, Arizona State, big game this week. Arizona State's got their starting quarterback back. I have the game on. They just resumed the game. They're up 21-14 in Stillwater against Oklahoma State. This will be a challenge against Arizona State, a much better team than Arizona, better offense. That, and they, UCF's got to go on the road. We don't know the kick time. We think it'll be a 7 Eastern, which Kyle will be happy about because we were thinking at one point it might be a 10 o'clock kick, but uh, we might get a reasonable hour out of this. But I think we'll learn a lot about this UCF team next week, won't we? Yeah, most definitely. And listen, something Coach Malzahn has maintained throughout his tenure here at UCF is that the better teams, the good teams, get better late. And this could be what we see in this UCF team. I know no fan wants a five-game losing streak. But to see that broken, to see this team kind of come back from it all and put themselves in a position to, you know, make a bowl game, albeit a reduced honor, it's certainly something to where, and you've alluded to this, Eric, to where we could see what the future might look like to have guys step up to make a 26 run that makes them far more relevant in the conference, perhaps, as they look to retool rather than outright reboot. I think that's the biggest positive from this, right? Um, and listen, you mentioned the challenges for Arizona State. I think all of those are legitimate, but I don't feel like UCF is just 100% out. I mean, hell, if they were if they were favored going into this football game, I have no reason to believe that Vegas does the same. But by the same token, hey, they were favored against BYU. What do they know? So, you're on mute, bud. That is correct. I was muted. Because I'm just listening to the rain behind you. So we're going to let you go, Kyle. Go have fun get soaked there. Avoid that weather. What happened? Hey, what is going on here? I'm safe in my perch, thank goodness. I'm not getting all that rain down except for the backs of my legs here. So I'll be fine. But 
I'll see you guys soon with night class on the black and gold banneret.com. But until every next time, everybody, class dismissed. All right, that's Kyle Nash from the Monsoon there. Mark Soskin jumping in. UCF has now outscored its opponents by 70 points so far this season, which is pretty funny considering they're under 500. Obviously, uh, they've had three blowout wins this year. That helps that stat. A um, couple minutes here and uh, before we sign off, but I, I want to keep Don and Bryce in here for a couple of moments here because obviously focus on football. Arizona State will be covering that this week, but there's also the start of college basketball season this season. Uh, begins Monday night, UCF against top 15 ranked Texas A&M here at, uh, in Orlando at UCF. Don will be there. A cast of thousands will be there. Women's basketball gets going Tuesday night against Iona. Bryson will be there for that. So I want your thoughts here on quick thoughts on the basketball season. I don't know if we'll do a podcast prior to the opener on Monday about both teams' seasons or not. But none. So I rather want to get your thoughts here. Final thought, Don. Start with you. Big one for Johnny Dawkins and company. UCF men's basketball against a and uh, Still up in the air. Questions about Jalen Sellers' status. Uh, some good news I've heard over the weekend about Dior Johnson. I think he's going to be okay there. But uh, big test against Texas A&M to start on Monday night. Yeah, I agree. It is a big test. And in the uh, last exhibition game, we've seen uh, them get routed by Georgia. You know, so this Exhibition. Is- I know it's exhibition, but it's an SEC team, and they're about to face a top 15 ranked SEC team. And so, you know, it's it's going to be a tough test, but it's going to be really characteristic. I think maybe this is looking too far ahead. Um, I think it's going to be characteristic of how they handle the Big 12. Even if they lose this game, if they can hang, it's going to give me confidence for their Big 12 schedule. And um, obviously, like I've talked about on previous shows, this is a very deep guard room. 11 new players, nine of which are transfers, highlighted by the acquisition of Mikey Williams. Uh, And now with the Jalen Sellers injury and some uncertainty around when he's coming back, we might see more of Mikey. Uh, We're going to see what Dior Johnson can do. And we're going to see how Darius Johnson um, can lead this backcourt without his backcourt running mate with him. Um, You know, he was strong against FGCU. Obviously, the second exhibition game didn't go as well. But like you said, it's just exhibition. And uh, we'll see what they do. Um, I'd say outside of FAU, I mean, this is the this is going to be the hardest non-con game with, in my opinion, FAU being second. Oh, no, it, no. Well, I, I, I would put that tournament in West Virginia where they got Wisconsin, potentially Pitt as tougher. Pitt was an NCAA, is a, a team that's been, uh, you know, two years ago made the NCAA Tournament Sweet 16. Just missed the tournament last year. I think Wisconsin was a 20-game winner program. I would say right there in the mix. FAU's got a lot of questions. and This is not the the final four FAU team. No, 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 it's not. But, I mean, they had a decent season last year. Um, no doubt. D- 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 despite not having that final four success that they uh, recently enjoyed. But, I uh, nevertheless, this is going to be the, – the month of November and December is going to provide some interesting tests for this team – uh, ahead of Big 12 play, and it's a long season, and we're going to see how they respond in these moments, uh, you know, because it, college basketball is characterized by upsets, so they can't just go into certain games thinking, oh, these are the ones we got to prepare for while we sleep on other teams, you know, because you can very well lose to a Tennessee Tech or Jacksonville, and so we're going to see what they do. Um, obviously, this is a defensive first team, even though they are um, lined with offensive talent. And we're going to see how Coach Dawkins brings it all together. And um, it's going to be fun to see the results. I am incredibly excited for Monday night. Interested to see if they have enough rim protection, too, for their defense. Are they assignments defensively? They struggled guarding the three-point line in the two exhibition games. I think those are some things to watch from a team that's got literally, what, nine to ten new faces? I mean, they got a, you know. Eleven total. And, yeah, I mean, especially at, yeah, especially down low. I mean, with uh, Mustafa Chiom and uh, Rokas, uh, we're going to – they're, they're going to have to be ready to play some physical ball. They're going to have to play smart, you know, stay out of foul trouble um, and really just lock down that paint for their team so that they can get out and transition better. Um, you know, good defense opens up the offense. And I think that's why Johnny Dawkins places such a heavy emphasis on defense first. So yeah. Yeah. Elo and Bryson, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun time. I'm, I've been waiting for this moment since I joined you guys and we're right on, we're right on the cusp. 
Mark well, Soskin writing in, by the way, AM ranked 13th in one of the polls, favored four and a half point favorite. UCF loaded with guards, but least deep in the front court. Benny Johnson, a pleasant surprise at forward so far. I agree, agree with that, that about Ben? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, Benny was awesome in the first game or the first exhibition game. I did not get to Curry's see him. been good too. Curry's been good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jordan Ivy Curry is awesome. I mean, even though he didn't shoot well in that game against FGCU, he was the team's leader in assists. I think he's got good court vision, and I think that he will provide a nice break, so to speak, for, for Darius, um, or if Darius is playing off the ball, you know, if they wanted to go with a smaller backcourt, they could roll with Jordan and he could be the facilitator. Darius can focus on scoring or vice versa, because let's not forget, uh, Jordan averaged, I believe, over 17 points a game uh, last season. So uh, one of the new faces that um, can bring a good scoring boost to this team, amongst other things. Uh, but yeah, Benny Johnson has been a great surprise. He's very physical. Uh, he plays like a true big, even if he's not quite that size. Um, and so I think that he's going to be a uh, very pivotal and sort of an X factor down there in the front court. Bryson, you'll be at the women's opener, uh, City of Messer and company. Uh, what year is this for coach Messer now here at UCF? Is it her fourth, third year, third year? Yeah, she um, had, a, a, yes, I believe she had one, two. Yeah. You're yeah. Cause year one was the last year of the American last year, year two, this year is going to be year very good. Two. See, that's why you're here. Uh, your thoughts, what to expect, opener against Iona. They're going to be heavy favorites there. The big one there is on the Thursday night, I believe they play Marquette. But uh, I think people want to see some progress out of the women's basketball program, certainly some positives, because it's not gone well for women's sports in this fall with volleyball and women's soccer struggling. So what can we expect here for Coach Messer in year three? Well, Coach Messer said during media day she has a lot more bullets on this squad. Uh, she heard their exhibition was against Edward Waters, so might so might not be as telling as something that would be like a Georgia or FGCU. But when you look at the roster, you got Caitlin Peterson coming back, of course, but you have also have Hannah Gusters, who's been getting some praise around the college basketball. As Kyle Nagodu is coming back once again with a, with another with another year older. She really she had her moments last year. And then she also has uh, Nevaeh, Nevaeh Brown, grad student from ETSU coming in. Uh, I was remember talking to Akat, uh, the forward coming out, and she was talking about how she was working on herself during this offseason as well. Uh, and then you have true freshmen like Emily Rodriguez, Summer Yancey, Adian Ring, and Eric and Arik Angui. So you have – I'm very interested to see who she ends up uh, who she ends up playing on this one but i do the i do see the talent here i really do the biggest key that i think i'm going to look out for with iona is how much is caitlin peterson going to be putting this team on her back because if you're if she's already doing that against iona then that might not bode well with uh marquette the best way i can describe it is that caitlin peterson is in my opinion is like McKen how McKenna Melville was with volleyball. She needs to be the, the person you go to when you need something to get done. I think that KP has proven herself as that kind of player, but she needs to have a supporting cast behind her. And that's what I think Coach Messer worked on over this offseason. Um, even like even even the previous year, recruiting Akat and Nagodu and playing them as much as she did last year. Not only do you get do you want to get those two on the court together more and get them more court time. But you also want to give KP enough of a supporting cast so that way she doesn't have to do it alone all the time and be able to open her up on the open her up on the floor. So I'll be very interested to see how that works out. There's plenty of freshmen she'll be able to go to. We'll see how much she, they end up playing. But I think my eyes are going to be on KP on, on KP and how much she ends up getting the ball because one after Iona, you know, they have a, another a tough one in Marquette coming to town. Both of you, give me a player, Don, on the men's side, Bryce on the women's side. Give me a name of a player, not the star player. Give me a name of a player that you think is a key that could be the barometer for how the season goes. Uh, I would say Jordan Ivy Curry for the men's. Um, I, I think like I like I was just alluding to, um, he, he has good court vision. Uh, when he's not scoring, he can be your assist guy. Um, you know, he... He put together a strong uh, campaign at UTSA last season. Now we'll see how he transitions into Big 12 play, playing for a more major program in a more major conference. Uh, but I think he's ready for the moment. 
And I think he's going to provide some great depth for this team. And then um, for the women's side, I'm really looking forward to seeing Nevaeh Brown play. I mean, she led her team at ETSU in pretty much every offensive statistical category last season. Uh, she's a good perimeter shooter. Uh, and I think that she will also provide a boost uh, beyond Caitlin Peterson, because we have to remember about this women's team. Uh, Peterson was the only, not, not only did she lead the big 12, that was impressive, like in terms of scoring, but she was the only night to average double digit figures in scoring. The next closest was uh, Maya Burns, I believe with like, almost 10 points a game. She was at 9.9 .9 last time I checked the statistics. And so I think that Nevea Brown, uh, I'm not exactly sure what her role is going to be. Um, probably coming off the bench uh, behind Layla Jewett, uh, possibly. But I think that she uh, could be an X factor for this team as well and a nice surprise. Well, interesting. Well, interesting you actually say that because I am look because I'm actually looking on women's basketball block because I was look because I have this mon monitor over here to d check my notes and Layla Jewett is actually not on the roster anymore with the roster page. What? And she's not on the roster. So I looked her up and women and WBBblog.com, the website that we use to keep track of the women's basketball transfer portal. I use that a lot. They have Layla Jewett listed as in the transfer portal. As a graduate transfer, she, it says she entered on October 28th, which was a few days This ago. week, last past week, yeah. Yes, so I don't, uh, so, I mean, I know you mentioned that, but I think Jew, I, but no, yeah, I. but yeah, she's not on the roster anymore, so I'm inclined to, inclined to say that I think Jewett is actually out. That which, is, wow. Sorry, Bryson. Yeah. Breaking news, Bryson here. This is breaking news you just broke here. Absolutely. So, I mean, that is it. I mean, I don't know what that, what that means. Maybe it means that I, the best I could see is that I knew that this guard group was like, I knew this guard group was also relatively deep, especially when you factor in the guard, the, the utility guard forwards and, and summer Yancey and Emily Rodriguez, the two true freshmen. I wonder if uh, uh, the best the, 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 keep in mind, I'm only speculating here. The only reason I could see Layla making that move is if she knew that the the freshmen were progressing enough in a way where the, where they were going to get a lot of court time and she wants to take advantage of her last year as a graduate as a graduate transfer i mean it's it, well and, the, and the, the interesting question now bryce because she entered this week so in theory she could be eligible the next semester to play somewhere else right that we've seen that we've seen that with uh with coach messer has brought in players halfway through a year yes yes she has done that before so it will be interesting to see where Layla ends up. Ends up if she ends up at another Big Twelve pro, uh, program. She uh, had she entered this year, she uh, this year she would have been the only one on the team to carry over from the Abe era. So mm. all of a sudden, like the the all of a sudden the hold the last holdover from the coach Abe era has left the has now entered into the transfer portal. This is a fully Satya Messer roster now, and that's wow. going. I mean, keep in mind, like, even with Jewett on the roster, the majority of the roster is still Coach Messer. And that, it's something that I remember uh, that I have been saying about this women's basketball team for a while now is that Coach Messer has had to basically restock the cupboard ever after she got, got here. And it's going was going to take time to do that. Caitlin Peterson definitely, I think, helped accelerate the process. Ak uh, Akat and Nagodu. Uh, all playing a lot as true freshmen, I think has also been in a style of that. And both of them showed a lot of promise. And to answer your earlier question, Eric, I actually think that the, the, the non-star player to watch for on this team, I'm not going to say one of the true, uh, I, I, it's tempting to say one of the true freshmen, but it's really hard to gauge exactly what they are, but I'm actually going to go with a, with Akka because her last year she had kind of ran into some ish, kind of, you know some injury issues and she wasn't ex and all that and so i think that how much she, she progresses this year i think will be a very and the front and the, the the and that in the forward group that's going to i think prove a a, a barometer in how well this team is going to do from a, on an overall standpoint but there's a lot of true freshmen on this squad. And so I would look at Emily Rodriguez. Emily Rodriguez was recruited. These, this was a, this was a woman that was recruited by like the best basketball programs in the country. And she chose to come here 
And so that wow. is good. So it'll be interesting to see how Coach Messer utilizes her. And I, and to me, when I look at this guard, when I look at this guard group, the only reason I could see Layla Jewett entering the transfer portal is if Emily Rodriguez or or Brown potentially are progressing a lot or are showing more in the in in practice than maybe was initially thought. Possibly, but then you know Jewett was a good shooter from the perimeter. Do you have that? On your roster, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Your assist leader last season. Yeah, no, that's so big news there, Bryson Turner. Brick <laughs> wasn't expecting a women's I basketball breaking news, but uh, okay, there you go. We'll see how that impacts yeah, this week. Yeah, no, I would. Yeah, so apologies if you saw my face just kind of looking confused off into the <laughs> off, uh, off there because that was what uh, I was thinking. Is I noticed, like, huh, Layla Jewett wasn't here. Hey, Bryson, you get to ask Coach Messer the question about that in the post game on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's going to uh, be fun. That's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, we gotta, boy. Can't ask softballs. Um, got to ask the tough ones. <laughs> John, I have a question for you, my friend, because this, I be, this is your first UCF football game in the press conference, in the press box, correct? It is. It is. Oh. How was it? How was it there? You had a pretty good, you got treated to a pretty good game as your first time. Yeah, it was great. You know, it was good to see a win, especially after uh, my, my very first experience for the audience might not know was uh, against Florida. I went to Gainesville with Kyle and I covered that and that was a excellent environment. Um, you know, full respect to the Florida Gators and, and Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. That was 90,000 strong. And um, while they were the opponent, I, I have to give props there. But yeah, th this was, you know, to, to see a team in my first game, you know, the Knights only score 13 points. And now to see what they've racked up today, uh, it's just night and it, it quite literally night and day. And, um, you know, I overall, the atmosphere at the bounce house, while it wasn't a sold out game. I mean, it was popping. The crowd was loud. Uh, the press box was comfortable. I got to, you know, see a lot of friendly faces, meet a lot of new people as well with it being a home game. And uh, I'm excited to be back. I believe my next one will be with you, Bryson, because we will be uh, filling in for the absent uh, Kyle Nash for Utah on Black yeah, Friday. Well, yeah, we need to make that happen. Very good. Uh, more basketball comments coming in, by the way. Keyshawn Hall is a big, strong guard who will need to use his inside game when Dawkins goes to a four-guard offense. J.J. Taylor is also a guard-slash-forward who's a 6'8 wing guy. I agree, Mark. I, I'll be curious to see Coach Dawkins. I've heard whispers. Try to go more up-tempo. Might see some more four-guard play. That's become the new norm in college basketball, so that, that could be another factor to keep an eye on. Yeah, Mark, that's a great point. Keyshawn was excellent in um, that exhibition game I covered against FGCU. He's someone who is strong and can finish around the rim. Um, he's great at the line. He's very methodical with uh, how he handles the ball. And uh, shout out to him, a fellow Northeast Ohio native, just a really friendly, uh, well-put-together person, and I think he's going to be a great addition to this team. Unbelievable. Uh, it's going to be interesting. should be fun. It gets going Monday for the men's side. Women's Tuesday. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Eric. I know I've thrown you for a loop. I am yeah, sorry. I am. Did you guys talk to Ju? Was Jewel like in media day? Yeah, she, she was. excited like, to be back. She was. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's clearly that this was a very much a recent development. Yeah. Yeah. I'd is. say it so. Is. It, either that or something was bubbling under the surface. I don't want to speculate too much, um, but it's interesting because her and Darius Johnson, uh, they're anomalies in the modern college basketball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, she was set to be a four year player all at UCF, just like he was. And uh, if she did indeed leave this program, right ahead of the season yeah there's there's gonna be some tough questions i kind of agree with bryce and my instincts tell me this has got to be a playing time issue there and bryce it might be on to something there it's got to be well, being such no a key part of the team why would that even be a question unless she wasn't performing well enough in practice or bright or to, to bryce it's point maybe the freshmen have a little more upside and they're yeah. gonna go with them uh because that's that part of the future I mean, in that case, then I think that definitely puts a lot of onus on the freshmen to see like, all right, like, let's see what, you know, the co coach saw in practice that would in right. practice that right. lead to that. Because if that's the, because let's say Emily Rodriguez, like absolutely balls out and be and becomes like, like a star of this team right next to Caitlin Peterson, then I can be like, okay, yeah, now I see what I can see what you're talking about with that. So it that it'll wow. be interesting to watch this program because I feel like <laughs> this is this is the year for Coach Messer 
that determines what the temperature of her seat is going into the going into 20 going into the season after this one if you succeed this year then it's fine you're it's pretty cool you're safe but if it doesn't work out very well or you don't show improvement after last year so all right what, that little all right let's do this then both of you what would be what would you consider a successful season for the women's and then we'll get into the men's prediction here what would you consider with the women a successful season. In fact, I'm going to give you time to think about that. Let's go to the men's side first because I want Bryson to look up the women's Big 12 state, uh, preseason poll uh, so you can kind of dissect it because I know the men by by memory because, my God, the men's in the Big 12 is insane. We got five teams in the top 10 uh, in the Big 12 in men's basketball, including Arizona. So don't, don't worry. They're not going to check out when we go to the McHale Center there. What is a realistic goal here, Don, for the men's UCF hoops teams? I know there's excitement and things like that, but this is a, a just a brutal conference that, to me, just to even have a chance to make the NCAA tournament, you probably got to finish in the top 10 in the Big 12. Top 10 just to have a shot, if, you know, depending on the experts. Some people think that the Big 12 could be anywhere from an 8 to 10 bid league. I think you've got five teams that could make it to the final four. UCF's got to play all of them at least once. So I don't know what's a fair expectation that's going to please people here. What do you say? Yeah, it's um, I think this is why Coach Dawkins felt that he had to be so aggressive in the offseason. And he said as much at Media Day, he said they knew that they had to up their talent level. And I think that they did. But it, it's going to be a tough one. I mean, they barely escaped um, with an above 500 record last season. Overall, I don't quite remember what their Big 12 uh, play record was. I believe that they were a few games below 500, not quite as bad as the women's. Well, they won um, seven. I believe they were seven wins in the Big 12, which, remember, people didn't think they would win two or three games going into the year. So they, I think they surprised a lot of people. They were picked dead last. They did not finish last in the Big 12 uh, from that standpoint. But this league is bigger. Remember, Arizona's in the league. Utah's in the league. Arizona State's in the league. So uh, it's a bigger league, and it's still the number one conference. Kansas supposedly is better than last year. They're the pick for a lot of people's pick for the national title. Houston is reloaded. Iowa State brings everybody back. Baylor retools, they're strong. Uh, Arizona is strong. A lot of people love Texas Tech and Cincinnati as teams that could be in that six and seven spot. So this league is, you know, and if you're UCF, you've got to do damage in the non-conference and then steal some games at, at home and, and win some home games and steal some road games if you can in the Big 12. But it's tough, man. It's tough. And I always say men's basketball at UCF is the hardest job, and I don't know how – Fair are expectations for men's hoops because this team might, if they go seven, it's 20 games this year in conference too. Last year was 18. So they went seven yeah. and 11 last year, 20 games this year. They might go seven and 13, eight and 12, but that, you know, that could get you in the bubble in the tournament. And, but some people may not be satisfied and that's what makes this so tricky. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's very true. Elo. You know, they're going to be going against, um, you know, March Madness mainstay programs. And I, I believe, yeah, because like you said, they, you know, they, they up the Big 12 play from 18 to 20. So now that manifests as a double date with uh, Kansas. You know, they play them in the beginning of January with the home opener for the Big 12. And then they have to go on the road and play them again. That's something they didn't have to do last season. And so it's going to be quite the test for this team. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, they're really going to have to dominate non-conference because if you lose even a couple of games in non-conference, you're really uh, putting the clamps on yourself and you've really up the ante and the pressure to need to win the harder games down the line. So expectations, I don't want to do any record predictions. Um, I think, you know, an amazing scenario for this team would be to qualify for the tournament. I'm thinking probably more of the realm of NIT, though. Fair, fair. Bryson? For me, I think it's we're just looking for progress. I I, I think to, to expect them to make the tournament is a little bit is, – is premature right now. I mean, let's remember that this is a Big 12 conference that includes the likes of Ioka Lee from Kansas State one of the best basketball players in the country, Haley Van Lith, Lith on TCU. I like this is, and Baylor has two all preseason, all big 12 teams and Sarah Andrews and Aaron and Vonley. I, I'm not going to say that about postseason. I'm honestly, I actually think that, that getting in the postseason, I wouldn't expect that right out the gate. Maybe like, um, 
let me see. I, I don't know. I think it was WNIT or like the NIT equivalent. Yeah, of, you're talking about the women's for the record. For those one, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Um, you, you so you UCF is projected to finish 14th in the conference, which was the exact same position they finished in last year. It's just that last year 14th was last place. Uh, I think that you imp- I think it's just you just improve off of that because UCF is actually in the same region as BYU and Cincinnati. Only a few votes separate those uh, separate BYU and Cincinnati from UCF. So Arizona State is also right behind UCF. So I would say that top 10 would be, I think, pretty would be pretty nice. But I think if you're able to just improve on last year, you get you get a better conference, re- you get a better conference record. I think that would definitely help. They were three and fifteen in conference play last year. So if you do better than that, um, maybe by a few ga- few games, like say, oh, I don't know, maybe like eight games maybe like if you get eight games that would be a like a, i wouldn't if you're just bubbling under 500 in conference play then i think that would definitely can be considered a success in my opinion in my opinion but i think you just want to outdo your expectations that's the big thing because remember we messer has needed to restock the cover so i you just want to see improvement you want to see hey is the cupboard stocked and if it's look and if it looks like we're giving some fight even if we're not winning every game, especially when it's against the Haley Van Lifts and the Ioka Lees of the world, then at least we're showing progress. It's like, all right, let's see what this can grow into. So I think, so I think as, as far as expectations go, I think we should try to expect to be, to be better than what we were before, which was 14. So higher, any higher than 14, I would say is a success. I would say a resounding success. If it was top 10, potentially, uh, you know, NIT equivalent bound, if that's and ends up being the case. We'll see. We will cover it all on BlackEagleBattery.com. Basketball, the previews up, what you need to know about the men's and the women's basketball. That's already up on the site. Be sure to look out for that. We'll have full coverage from the arena Monday, Tuesday for the respective season openers for those two programs. We'll have up, uh, post games here on the YouTube channel uh, as well, press conferences and much more. We'll get into more on the two programs, the two teams as the days and weeks go by. It's really on the women's side. There's a lot of interesting topics to get in on that one from a standpoint of interest. Can they find, get people interested in women's basketball? Uh, case in point here, some people have tuned out as soon as we talk women's hoops. I'm not surprised by that. Can they turn that around? We'll see. And can the men's turn some interest as well? Keep that momentum from last year where they sold out a lot of games. That will be an interesting story. But we'll get into all that another time. But Don's got to work. He's still in the press box. So we're going to let him go. And bracelet has got to do stuff. And I got to do stuff. So, um we'll do some more hoops talk maybe before the if not before the opener certainly next week as well and uh, bryce and i so at some point we'll do get into some fall ball baseball and softball down the road we both have caught some action on both sides so uh but today was a victorious day for ucf football dominant performance over arizona they will be in tempe next saturday night against arizona state arizona state's up two touchdowns as we go off the air uh against oklahoma state 28-14, Arizona State's running backs got nearly 200 all-purpose yards. So he's going to be going to be tough to deal with. Plus, their starting quarterback, Levitt's back. So that'll be a good one next Saturday. We'll have a night shift following that game, whatever the time is on that one. Thanks to Kyle Nash for joining us earlier in the show. Thanks to Don Brown in the uh, – what are you, in the coach's presser where, uh, conference? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm too down from the from the press box. So. Uh, it's become our yeah. place. Thanks for the UCF folks for letting us use that coach's room, the visiting coaching room. Uh, there Bryson back home from the stadium thank to all of you for your comments and questions make sure you subscribe and like on our YouTube channel and check out black and go Kyle Nash will have his recap his night class grades coming up later tonight uh there so for the whole cast here Eric Lopez saying so long nice victorious they keep the space game uh, game perfect with a dominant performance over Arizona good night and charge on on this edition of Night Show.